Welcome and aloha. I'm Mark Shklov, the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going across Hawaii's legislative sea to talk with Scott Matayoshi. Scott is the state representative for House District 49, which included Kaneohe, Manawili, and Olamana, although Olamana will no longer be in the district after this year because of redistricting. Uh, Scott is also a practicing lawyer with a private law firm in downtown Honolulu. Uh, Scott is my representative. I, I live in Manawili and I wanted to talk with Scott about various issues that came up during the recent legislative session. And I wanted to find out his vision for Hawaii's future. And during this process, I discovered that I'm not the only person in Manawili that wants that talk with Scott. So Scott, I wanna welcome you. Hello, how are you? Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Uh, you know, I'm glad that the uh, legislative session is over. And now I, I, I think you have some time and I wanna take this opportunity to ask you a few tough questions uh, about issues that are important to the people you represent. And I'm glad that you've accepted my invitation. So first, I mean, we got a lot of, lot of questions. So, but let me, let me start. Um, how, how are you doing, first of all? Uh, well, I, you know, I, I have a two month old at home, so uh, I'm a little tired. Uh, he's not sleeping great, which means I'm not sleeping great and my wife isn't sleeping great. Uh, but otherwise, you know, the legislative session finally wrapped up. Uh, today's my first day back at my law firm. So a little bit of a change of pace for me, uh, but I'm still dealing with all of the issues that come up after the, after the legislative session. Uh, I passed a couple of bills, so I'm trying to get those passed into law and signed and not vetoed, you know, et cetera. Okay, well, I want to focus on the public's view of our legislators. I mean, that, that's what you know hit me right off the bat. There have been several recent discouraging examples of public corruption and ethical failures by members of the legislature, including taking bribes and allegations of drunk driving. And, and there was lots of talk amongst le legislators that some action would be taken to combat public corruption. Now, was anything done this session to deal with these problems within the legislature? Uh, yes, uh, so let, let's start with the, the drunk driving accusation from Representative Haar. Uh, we did form a special committee to uh, investigate these uh, th those allegations. Uh, it was actually brought up by a couple of community members from Representative Haar's own district requesting the uh, special committee. So I, I sat on that committee and we did come down with the recommendation after hearing both sides and uh, determined that, well, it was a little bit difficult for us because the court the court, court acquitted her of any wrongdoing, basically. Uh, she does have a uh, suspension of her driver's license for refusing the field sobriety test. But other than that, when the court of law acquits a person, it, it's a little difficult for the legislature to then come in and say, no, no, she, she is guilty of something. That being said, uh, the special committee did decide to uh, well, we, we asked her to formally uh, tell us what her punishment was from the administrative hearing for the driver's license revocation. And she also needs to affirm uh, when it's done in two years that she uh, followed uh, and fulfilled all of the requirements uh, required by that administrative hearing. I did personally want a little bit more punishment, at which I said in the committee, and I voted with reservations in the committee for that. I, I thought that we should have probably had, had her at least do a pu more public apology, uh, not only for driving the wrong way in Baratania, but also by from going to a restaurant uh, with, or with an illness, with a respiratory illness during the pandemic in early 2021, which I thought was inappropriate. So, you know, it, it is what it is, but that, that's what we did with that particular one. Um, for the Kai Cullen and Kalani English bribery case, I mean, that, that honestly, that rocked the Capitol. That was, I've never seen anything like it. I've never heard of anything like that here in Hawaii. Um, very, very surprising. Uh, I was personally very disappointed in the actions of those legislators who, you know, stepped down or, or I guess uh, Senator English had already stepped down. But I, I don't know what else to say. I, I was very disappointed. Uh, the legislature did take action this uh, term. We did pass a law. We actually brought it back from was introduced last year 
but it was allowed that bans fundraisers during the legislative session. So we passed that. Um, Representative Kitagawa also introduced a, a bill to curb the influence of dark money in our elections, uh, which we passed. It's not quite as strong as I would have liked, uh, but you know, politics is, politics is about compromise. But we did get that bill passed. It's so awaiting the governor's signature. Um, and members are required to participate in, in ethical, uh, ethics training, additional ethics training, actually, uh, just to make sure that the point is driven home that uh, there shouldn't be any funny business in the legislature. But I mean, I, I'm really hoping that this is, this is a big wake up call to a lot of legislators to just simply follow the law and, and you know, act ethically. Well, you know, it, it sounds like a start to me. Uh, I would, you know, people are, get discouraged when they see things like that happen with their legislators, people that represent them. Um, well, anyway, thank, thanks for that update. Um, now, the, the other thing I, I learned is, as I walk around Monowilly Valley every day to get a little exercise, uh, I regularly meet neighbors and I have been letting them know that I would be interviewing you today for my program. And many of them had questions which they sent me and they wanted me to ask you. Uh, one neighbor, Larry, who is a university professor, was very concerned about the lack of public school facilities in Hawaii. He noted that, for example, Kailua High School's library has been closed for several years because the roof leaked, which has left students with no place to use computers on campus. He also felt that the State Department of Education has neglected Kailua High School students because of that, and that they also treated women at Campbell High School who asked for a locker room with hostility because they, they, they didn't provide them with an opportunity to somewhere change except under the bleachers. Now, what are your thoughts? What's your position? What can the legislature do to provide not, 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 not just good facilities, but excellent facilities and opportunities for public school students? Well, I mean, as I don't know if you know this, but I was a public school teacher. I, I taught middle school science at Nanakuli before becoming an attorney and eventually a state legislator. So I, I when you talk about school facilities, uh, Nanakuli was pretty uh, a pretty sad state of disrepair when I was there. Not not falling down or anything like that, but certainly could have used a lot more uh, infrastructure improvement. Um, I, I'm not familiar with the Kailua High School issues. That that's not in my district. Um, and I, I, I would like to defer to at least Senator Lee and, and Rep. Martin, who are uh, in that district, who do represent the Kailua High School District, uh, as, as to why the roof is leaking. That this is honestly the first time I'm hearing of it. Um, each year, though, legislators do have what we call a capital improvement project uh, requests that we put in to do certain repairs. Um, so, for example, I, I put in a request that was granted for a covered play area for Monwili Elementary, which I do represent because it's in the Olamana subdivision. Um, and that was granted. Uh, but as far as Kailua's library, I, I'm, I'm a little appalled <laughs> that there is a leak in a library, uh, especially with all the books and computer equipment that's undoubtedly there. And, and just having it, providing a place for students to uh, be able to read and study and, and interact with the library staff. That's very important to me. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised that that hasn't been repaired yet. Uh, we did have a, a problem with leaking at Monowilly Elementary, which again is part of my district. And I went to the DOE and pretty much demanded that they fix the roofs at Monowilly Elementary, and we got that done. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not too sure how to answer this question because it's not in my district. Um, but certainly, the DOE got a huge infusion of cash this year for uh, infrastructure projects. The problem that they're going to be facing right now is because they have this huge infusion of money uh, that I believe does lapse in two years, I'm not sure they have the manpower <laughs> to implement all the changes that are needed. So I, I would strongly encourage the legislature uh, next session or perhaps the session after to extend the deadline uh, for DOE to use this funding before it comes back to the, the state so that we can get as many uh, repairs and improvements done uh, over the next couple of years as we can. And so, I mean, is the DOE doing its job and can it do more, can it do a better job? Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about facilities still or are you talking more generally? Well, I'm talking about facilities. Okay. Uh, that, that was Larry's question. Uh, and I mean, he just felt that our, our, our children 
should should have a better public school facilities generally. Yeah, I mean, I would have loved to teach in a in a much nicer classroom. <laughs> believe me. Uh, so I'm, I'm right there with Larry. Uh, the DOE has been doing quite a bit with the resources that we've given it. I, I do think that we need to fund education better, and we have not been funding it. That's actually one of the reasons I ran for office. But the DOE is limited by their their budget. They did create a kind of a school facilities branch, which should streamline the repair process uh, processes. So I'm hopeful to see that uh, starting to kick in more over the next couple of years. Um, but right right now, I mean, could the DOE be doing more? I, I think they have been doing as much as they can with the funding that they've been provided. It's just which priorities are being uh, tackled first, I guess. Uh, again, I. I, I think a, a leaking library roof should be a very top priority, but I, I'm, I'm not the DOE. Okay, well, will you keep on top of it? Yes, but again, Kailua High School is not in my district. It, I, I've got Castle High School, I've got a bunch of elementary schools. That really needs to be my priority. The priority for the legislators representing the area that covers Kailua High School, that should, that's their legislative prior, uh, prerogative as well. It's not considered a light to reach into other people's areas to, okay. to mess around like that. Um, and, and again, I think I would be doing a disservice to my constituents if I were to try to direct resources and repairs outside of the district when, again, we have our own uh, set of problems to deal with that I need to be fighting for as well. Okay. Another neighbor, Chris, who is a leader in our community here, Manawili, noted that you helped the Manawili Community Association communicate with the State Department of Land and Natural Resources in order to close Monowilly Trail for two years, in order to realign the trail. But Chris wants to know if the state is providing sustainable funds to the DLNR to create and maintain trails in a manner that is good for the land, the impacted communities, historical sites, and the trail users. Um, yeah, I mean, DLNR has a lot of responsibilities. They're, they're not just a trail maintenance organization, uh, as, as Chris knows. And, and Chris is a good friend of mine, actually. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I did help to shut down Manuili Falls Trail for a couple of years, not only to let the land heal, but because it was just being such a nuisance to the community. That was one of, another reason I ran. I used to live in Manuili, um, was that, that that trail was driving the Manuili Estates community crazy. I mean, just from the trespassing, the noise, the, everything, you name it. I actually volunteered to do a shift um, at that trailhead to tell hikers that it was closed and to direct them to other trails, more, uh, legal trails. Uh, that being said, you know, all the trails, the trails are a bit of a mess around the, the state, um, partially because they're owned by different entities. Some are state, some are city, some are privately owned. Um, the resources necessary to manage all of those trails and all the miles and miles of trails, which are not easy to get to, a lot of them, um, is, is immense. We have certain organizations, certain nonprofits that are helping to repair trails, you know, keep ropes safe and things like that, which I very much appreciate. But um, I think we need a little bit more of a consolidated approach. So more funding to trail maintenance certainly would help. Um, I think that I, I actually uh, introduced a bill to try to get illegal hikers to pay for their own rest, search and rescues, which I think would also help uh, defer the cost of just general trail maintenance, because that money does come out of the pockets of uh, the fire department, DLNR, et cetera, to, to pay for those rescues. Um, but yeah, you know, we've got what, so many priorities. What happened to that bill? It, it, it did not make it. <laughs> but I will be trying again next year uh, with a little more with a little more nuance. Uh, but I did pass a resolution that puts together kind of a working group for um, DLNR to get together with the, so the state, the city, private individuals to get together. Uh, anyone with an interest in these trails themselves to create sort of a legal whitelist of trails that are permissible. And I'm hoping that that'll give enough legal notice instead of, you know, plastering signs everywhere that, that get vandalized and destroyed. I'm hoping if we can create a legal list of trails, then that will provide sufficient legal notice of people who are not on that trail to tell them that not only are they, are they on an illegal trail, but to allow the state or city to go after those people for trespassing in that case. Um, I think just putting, putting signs everywhere is not a practical uh, financial or just generally practical solution to providing legal notice. So I'm hoping that whitelist will help. Well, Chris had another question about the DLNR and, 
based on her personal experience. And, and she was wondering if giving the DLNR the stewardship of Mauna Kea and TMT was a good idea. Based uh, on so she's talking about House Bill 2024. Um, House Bill 2024 does not give DLNR sole stewardship of Mauna Kea. It provides them one seat um, of 11 members, out of 11 members of the authority that is going to govern Mauna Kea. So DLNR certainly does not have sole stewardship of the mountain, uh, but they do have a voice and add a seat at the table. Okay, all right. So they're not, she was concerned with that and whether they would be able to, to manage that. And it sounds like there's more of a team involved. Yeah, that, that, that's a fair concern. And, and House Bill 2024 has gone through a number of iterations, even during this last legislative, legislative session itself. So uh, Chris might have been talking about a different version. I, I'm just not sure. Okay. So an, another neighbor, uh, Jimmy, is a small business owner. He's concerned that the recent increase in the minimum wage would discourage hardworking Hawaii entrepreneurs from starting and developing their own businesses. Jimmy asked, is there any help on the horizon from the state government to incentivize entrepreneurship? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, Jimmy, another person I know pretty well, Jimmy, your, your taro chips are delicious. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the Department of Business and Economic Development, Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism has a handful of incentive programs uh, for small business owners. Uh, most of them are federally funded, um, but facilitated by the state. I, I would refer to DBED for um, additional resources for them. Uh, if they'd like to, I mean, you can probably Google this, but it's invest.hawaii.gov slash business slash business dash incentives dash programs. But that's a list of the business incentive programs currently being offered. And administered by the state. So you're saying there is some hope. Yeah, I think I think there I think there is some hope, and and you know I really want to encourage small business owners to to stick with it. The, the pandemic was really rough. I, I know Jimmy had a tough had a tough time. Uh, a lot of small businesses had had tough times, um, but I think it looks like we're hopefully coming out of it. So I'm, I'm hopeful hopeful for the future, and the government has been offering uh, certain programs to those who who seek it out. Okay, all right, so he, he should follow up on that. And an another neighbor had a, Cheryl, uh, who volunteers for many community associations, had some concerns also about the minimum wage. And she said, won't this raise the cost of food prices that will be passed on to customers, Hawaii re residents? Yeah, I'm assuming this is Cheryl of uh, Round Table Pizza. So hi, Cheryl, <laughs> good to, always good to see you. Um, yeah, I mean, minimum wage is a concern. Certainly, uh, I was more supportive of the original house plan, which much more gradually raised minimum wage uh, over a longer period of time. Uh, you know, the, the reality of the situation right now, at least, and, and I see it on, on all the signs and, and windows offering, uh, you know, saying help wanted, is that the effective minimum wage is already quite a bit higher than, than legally required. Um, I see $12 an hour, I see $15 an hour, so the, the free market has already sort of done its work. And I don't think you could hire someone for 10 10 an hour right now if, if you wanted to. I don't think, I'm not even sure you could hire someone for $12 an hour right now if you wanted to. Uh, but the way the minimum wage bill passed this year, I think it does reflect uh, kind of the more natural progression of the market as well. It, it will push it a little bit, but I think the market is already in a place where uh, 10 10 minimum wage, you, you're not gonna be getting any employees at that rate anyway. So. You, we, we are seeing it in, in higher food prices uh, currently, but you know part of that is due to the supply chain issues that we're experiencing as well. Uh, I, I'm not an economist. I, I don't know whether I could tease it out and, and blame one thing or the other, or, or even allocate percentages of blame, but I know there are a lot of issues um, that by their powers combined are leading to higher prices as, as well. I don't think it's just the minimum wage, but minimum wage, you know, that, that's meant for entry level jobs. As Cheryl and Jimmy know, um, you know it's meant for the the high school student or whatnot. It, it was never meant to be a wage at which someone could, uh, you know, afford a house and, a, and four kids kind of thing. So, and I'm hoping that people who are, if you are stuck in a minimum wage job somewhere out there, um, you have the courage to go out there and find a, a better job with more money because they're certainly out there right now. So you're you're saying that it, that even without the legislation. The, the minimum wage has, has risen. And yeah, yeah. the private industry already 
And so uh, it, it, the, the legislative uh, change ha has not affected it that much. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I've been seeing around town, at least. I mean, I think anyone who has eyes has seen the help wanted signs around uh, yeah. papering everywhere. And, and a lot of them advertise the hourly rate that businesses are willing to hire at. And I've never seen a help wanted at 1010 <laughs> uh, for, for a very long time now. So I think the effective minimum wage to get a living, breathing employee at your business is already higher than the legally mandated minimum wage. Yeah, fait accompli. Um, and now, uh, Cheryl also asked, is Hawaii able to follow other successful states in lowering the income tax rates? and conserving our resources so that residents who now have to pay higher taxes can afford to live in Hawaii instead of moving to the mainland in order to re retire. Uh, if we're talking about just income tax, I mean, it, it's hard to talk about income tax in, on an island. I mean, all, all taxes kind of integrate with each other. So, I mean, if we're talking about income tax, we, we've got to talk about property tax and corporate income tax and everything else as well. Um, yeah, I think the income tax is kind of a drag. It, it is uh, graduated income tax. So, you know, people who make a lot more money will, will pay more. Uh, I think we've really got to address, though, the property tax issue in the state. I, I would love to lower income taxes and raise property taxes more, especially for those who own second homes. I think that, or investment properties, I think that one of the issues that Hawaii is facing uh, has nothing really to do with the income tax. It has to do with our incredibly low property tax rates, which are the lowest in the nation when compared to the cost of the property itself. And what that does is it creates uh, opportunity for foreign and mainland investors to purchase property here, park their money because they know housing prices are going to go up, pay very, very little property taxes, and just keep kind of vacant homes or apartments uh, in our state as investment properties. That, that's not what we want. We want working families in those homes, in those apartments, paying, paying their taxes and, and having a place to live. Uh, right now, we've got families doubled, tripled up in houses just to kind of make ends meet. And I think part of the problem is we're allowing so much foreign investment because of our incredibly low property tax levels. But again, if we raise property taxes, the only way I would be comfortable with that is if we proportionally lowered income tax levels especially for working families so that it doesn't hit them as hard. So is that something you're going to work on? There, there were bills introduced um, in conjunction uh, this last legislative session, but it didn't go too far. I think a lot of people are very wor worried and wary, especially during election years, of saying, let's raise property tax levels. But the deal always was, we're not doing one without the other. Um, again, property taxes at the city level, income taxes at the state level, so that also makes uh, strange bedfellows. You know, we, we need to be able to work with the city to do both in conjunction. And the city has traditionally not been willing to raise property tax levels, perhaps because they're looking at us and waiting for us to uh, lower income tax levels in conjunction. So I think there just needs to be a lot more coordination between state and city on this issue. Well, OK, let, let me let me move on. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, development on Oahu, uh, you know, low income housing high rises in Waikiki, in Kaka'ako. Uh, is, is more development for Hawaii, and Oahu, and, and I don't know, in, in, in our area, in your, in your district, is that a good idea? Yeah, I, mean, I think it is, to, it, it, as long as it's controlled and done in, the, in a smart way. Uh, you know, everyone's got, well, I shouldn't say everyone's got kids. A lot of people have kids <laughs> that they would love for, to, to live in Hawaii, to, to move back home or whatnot. And the thing I hear from every single person without fail is they would love to move home, but there's nowhere for them to live. There are no houses to buy or the houses that, they, that are for sale are you know, 1.4 million or, or so with the, with the wall that's falling down. So we need, we certainly need housing. Um, I do not believe that we, need, we should keep sprawling out horizontally though. I think we've got to expand vertically in places that make sense. So Kaka'ako to me makes a lot of sense. It, it's very near downtown. Uh, you wouldn't need necessarily a car to commute to work if you work downtown. Uh, places are along the rail line, transit-oriented development has been talked about a lot. That has got to guide development in Hawaii. And uh, I remember 
when I interned for Senator Akaka in DC, the place I lived was a very dense uh, housing <laughs> uh, place called Crystal City. And what you could do is you could, you know, no one had a car there. You could take the elevator literally down into the metro station and get to work directly from there, which was great because DC has got very hot summers and pretty cold winters, especially if you're from Hawaii. Uh, but that kind of concept really resonated with me. You know, the, there was a place, there was a very uh, isolated areas of very dense housing that was very affordable even for, you know, an intern like me. Uh, and mass transit was so readily available that it just made no sense to, to buy a car. Uh, that's the kind of workforce housing that we need. And I think we can do that along the rail line, uh, you know, assuming the rail line gets to downtown and beyond. Yeah. But then we have to deal with water problems that came up also. <laughs> Climate change, right? I mean, yeah. how, how, how are we going to deal with those? Well, if you find a solution to climate change, you let me know. Uh, but I think that the rail is already elevated. Uh, I think we've, we've, we've moved it back to hopefully not be affected so much by climate change. Water issues are, that, that, that's a little bit of a newer one with the Red Hill uh, disaster. So I'm hoping that with Red Hill cleaned up and defueled, um, the Red Hill well will return to normal. Uh, they're talking about, you know, doing more regular testing of the of that, I think it was the Moana Lua shaft. I'm not, I'm not sure the exact name that they call it, but we're hoping to get that up and running or at least take new water shafts um, soon to get more water resources to the developers that, that, that need it, that are, again, building that workforce housing. I'm not saying that we need more of these luxury, uh, you know, condos that are being built in Ward and whatnot. That, that's not for us. That's targeting the mainland investors that I talked about earlier. What we need are more 801 South Streets. What we need are more workforce housing that's that's much more affordable and hopefully built along the rail line. So to minimize the need for you know extra cars and, and extra costs for those working families. Okay. Now you you mentioned earlier uh, that you you and your wife recently welcomed a, a new member of your family, Connor, who was born in March. Uh, now you know many young people have left Hawaii. Uh, what have you and the legislature done and plan to do to make Hawaii a good place for Connor and other keiki born here to grow up, live, work here now and into the future? But I'd be remiss to, to not mention my other son, Mason, who is, is almost two as well. Um, so, for, But for both of them, I mean, I, I would love for them to live and work in Hawaii. I know that's not always a reality. Um, you know, we're, we're never going to have every single industry that the mainland has in Hawaii. So if someone wants to be a certain kind of uh, job or doctor or whatnot, they may need to move to the mainland anyway, at least for a period of time. I know my, one of my cousins is training to be a neurosurgeon. We don't have a neurosurgery <laughs> residency program here, but he, he does hope to come back. Um, that being said, you know, I really think we need to diversify our economy. Our economy is really based on two legs right now uh, that bring outside money into Hawaii. Uh, we've got the military that brings outside money in, and we've got tourism that brings outside money in. We, we need another industry. And what we used to have was agriculture. So that's what I've been pushing for the last number of years, is creating another sustain, you know, agricultural program for Hawaii. And, and I'm not saying pineapple and sugar. You know, those days are long gone. We're not bringing the mills back. We're not bringing the plantations back. But I think that if we can do this in an intelligent way, there are certain plants, animals, that Hawaii can grow better than anywhere else in the world. We actually have a competitive advantage due to our geographic isolation, and we can create an export industry for that. Uh, one of the main ones that has been successful so far uh, has been SPF shrimp or specific pathogen-free shrimp uh, grown on Kauai, and they've also got some ponds in Molokai. And what they do is they breed the breeding pairs of shrimp that are disease-free, and those are shipped at about 50 bucks a pop to the Philippines or elsewhere where they have the land and they have the resources to uh, have them multiply into thousands and thousands of shrimp. You know, we're never gonna create ponds that are gonna outcompete the Philippines, but they need our disease-free shrimp to start it off. And that's what our geographic, that's using our geographic isolation now to our advantage. So things like that, we, uh, queen bees is another example. Uh, oyster spat is another example. I've, I've actually got a whole list on my phone. Um, and, and, and things like, uh, I know people don't like to hear this, but uh, things like seed crops as well. Uh, we, you know, we have less, certainly less cross-pollination than other places on the mainland. Uh, that is a high 
uh, not only a high money industry, but it could also create good scientific jobs for our returning kids to work in because you need to do uh, you know, seed husk scraping and things like that to make sure that, that, that genetically they're sound. So bringing those more high tech jobs, I think can be done related to agriculture. Uh, we, we just need a bigger push. And a lot of people have, you know, a lot of people think of agriculture as a thing of the past. I really think it's a, a thing of our future. And I'd really like to expand that and, and get those jobs so that people can move back. Okay, uh, we're getting close to the end of our time here. I wanna ask you, you know, briefly, was there any legislation that you supported that passed the legislature <laughs> here? Yeah, I, I was fortunate this year to finally get a bill that I've been working on passed. Uh, it bans flavored vaping uh, throughout the state or the sale of flavored vaping products. Uh, for those of you who don't know, flavored vaping products are, are disproportionately targeting children. We're, we're basically addicting another uh, generation or two of children on nicotine uh, with flavors like cotton candy and Sour Patch Kids. Uh, you, you know, I, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, vaping is so bad in schools that the DOE recently uh, put together a working group of principals and they gave them a list of educational topics and said, pick your four top educational topics that you want to advocate for. And vaping was not on there. Um, the principals came back with three educational topics and vaping as, as their, their top four priorities. They, they ignored the rules and added vaping to the list because it was so important and so impactful in their schools. And that really struck me as a, a wake up call to anyone who, who doesn't know the issue yet, that this is a major problem that we need to address now because the long-term health consequences, the long-term educational consequences are just, are just too high not to do anything right now. So we did get a, a bill through, it's not perfect. It does have a, uh, an exemption put in by the, by the Senate, but I think that it would effectively uh, and the sale of flavored vaping products as of January 1st, if it's signed into law. So I really want to encourage the governor to, to sign that into law if possible. Okay, well, well, we'll look forward to seeing if that happens. Now, in, in, the, in the minute we have left, <laughs> all right, many of the things that I've asked you about are somewhat discouraging or somewhat challenging. Um, what gives you hope for the future of Hawaii? I mean, my, my kids give me hope. <laughs> I mean, I, I see a new generation growing up uh, literally under my nose. Uh, you know, I, I think we have some tough problems to deal with. We have sea level rise to deal with. We've got, you know, and the associated climate change. Uh, we've got a lot of people moving to the mainland to find more affordable places to live. We've got cost of living issues. But I, I was really encouraged this year by the legislature and what we were able to do and accomplish this year. You know, $600 million to the Department of Flying Homelands. We've got hundreds of millions of dollars going to other programs. Uh, the one place I think we could have probably done more is for mental health and substance abuse treatment, but that is, a, that is an issue I, I'm looking forward to tackling next year if, if I'm reelected. Uh, but we've just put so much more money and resources into the economy because we had it this year. That, that, that really did give me hope that, uh, that we're gonna have a, you know, we, that there are better things to come, I think. Well, uh, Scott Matayoshi, my representative, Thank you very much. I appreciate your time today and talking. And uh, I, I'm glad that I was able to ask these questions. And I think this is a ongoing conversation. So thank you very much. Aloha. Mahalo. Good talking to you, Mark. Take care. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.